Being an educator is hard. It's hard if you're a teacher. It's hard if you're an administrator. And it's also very complicated. Hi, and welcome to Field Trip, the podcast where we share stories of excellence, innovation, and creative problem solving from school and district leaders. And then we dig into what they've learned. We need our teams to be places where we can bring what we're struggling with and it can be a safe place where we can collaborate on a solution. Our education system desperately needs more of an understanding of adult development. Every episode, we bring you an interview with someone in K-12. It could be a superintendent, a principal, someone in HR or instruction who has a story worth sharing. We spread the word about great things happening in school systems all across America and highlight takeaways that you can bring to your own role. Principals cannot do this work all by themselves anymore. No one can. Superintendents can either. We need each other. We need to grow and lift leadership in schools and in districts. And we cannot just expect that because someone is given a leadership role that they can just do it. From Frontline Education, this is Field Trip. So I have been an educator for 10 years. That's Christy O'Connor. Christy is a school administrator about an hour west of New York City at Florham Park. Which is a small K-8 suburban district in New Jersey. It's a district that's really committed right now to um, professional development and growth. Christy began her career as a teacher in the Bronx. And as time went on, she realized she cared not only about her own students, but about what happened beyond the walls of her classroom as well. I was a teacher who was in a really high-performing school district, and I can remember seeing things that I thought could be better. For instance, parent workshops or communication. And I remember I would go to my teammates who were really hardworking, lovely people, and I would say something like, you know what? The parents in my class just don't know how to support this new reading program. I think that it would be really helpful if we had a workshop for them. And I, I know you have requirements at home with your kids, with dropping them off. I'll do the workshop. Your parents can come. It'll be really great. It'll help us get more involvement. And the response that I would get would be, we love you, but don't do that because you're going to make all of us look bad. Eventually, Christy became a coach, and as time went on, she realized there was something no one was talking about in her circles. How do you teach teachers? And more than that, how do you equip teams of teachers to collaborate, share ideas, and advance their practice together? At first, I tried to, to say, this is what we need to do. Why? It was kind of like, why can't you do this? Why aren't you doing this? I'll give it to you. I'll show you how to do it. But then why, why doesn't this stick? She began learning about adult development, and that's when she met Dr. Ellie Drago-Severson in a summer principal's academy. I started out as a teacher. I was a coach and a counselor and also a program director. And one of the things that I recognized early on and wondered about was why it's so difficult to support teachers within schools. Ellie now works with aspiring and practicing leaders of all kinds. She taught at Harvard's Graduate School of Education for 10 years and since 2005 has been with Teachers College, Columbia University. She also conducts research and works with urban superintendents, but it was her early career that inspired her to examine the connection between adult development and student development and achievement. I had the chance to work in one school where the teachers, including myself, felt very well held and I I was a young teacher and I noticed that that seemed to have a direct and positive impact on the kids. I mean, they never wanted to leave. They would stay after school. We'd have to shoo them away. And then I had the opportunity to work in a, in a, in a very different school context where we would never sit around and talk about our practice. Professional development, Ellie said, was really sit and get. And what ended up happening was after one year of being there, more than 80% of the teachers left. And I went to the school principal and I said, why do you think that happened? Because it was devastating for the kids and for those of us who stayed. 
And the principal said, I don't know. Those events were the inspiration for Ellie's life's work, exploring the relationship between adult development and children's development. And the more I learned, the more I realized that I needed to learn more in, in order to have an influence on making schools better places where adults and children can both be growing. Because while people say, well, why, do you, you know, you might wonder, why is it important to care about adult development? I mean, there has been a solidly established relationship between what happens when adults engage in authentic learning opportunities and student achievement. And the first person who actually really um, was able to make that connection explicitly through quantitative methods was Thomas Gutsy from the University of Kentucky. And that was in the early 90s. And since then, people have really started to focus more on you know, providing better professional learning and development opportunities for adults, understanding that if we do that well, that that is going to help with teacher retention, principal retention, superintendent retention, and it's also going to dramatically impact student achievement, which is, you know, part of the bottom line. Um, Not the only bottom line, but it is an important bottom line. And Ellie's work, especially as it related to how teams of teachers can collaborate well together, really had an impact on Christy. Oh my goodness, I learned so much. Um, The first thing that I learned was about developmental diversity. You know, as a young teacher who, like everybody else, really cared about the kids and just wanted to do more and was willing to do work and give it to my colleagues because, you know, I was young and I didn't have kids. I couldn't understand why other people weren't just like me. And I couldn't understand why, if I shared something with them, why, or if I had an idea, like, let's do a parent workshop. And if I was willing to even do the work, why other people, you know, weren't excited and enthusiastic about it. And what I learned is that different adults have different ways of knowing. When I learned that, it allowed me to differentiate because as a leader, just like we ask our kids, our teachers to differentiate for our kids, we have to differentiate for our teachers. And so I started infusing some of the things that Ellie taught that that goes with adult development into everything that I did. And it made such a big difference in terms of feedback, in terms of how meetings were structured, in terms of how collaboration sessions went. And, And what happened is because people felt you know, safe and, and they felt invited and, and they felt like they were part of something, we actually were more productive. And what it also helped me realize is I understood why some people weren't like me. And it helped me know how to better tailor things and support them because the biggest takeaway is that it isn't about me, it's about helping them and where they are. I want to draw attention to something really important that Christy said she learned from Ellie, and that is that people have, quote, different ways of knowing. That is, meaning-making systems that adults use to make sense of their experiences. And Ellie said that we generally differentiate how we teach and interact with children, but we're not great at differentiating for adults. We wouldn't ask a two-year-old to solve a problem that required abstract thinking because we know that a two-year-old cannot do it. Yet we often ask adults to do things, teachers, principals, assistant principals, to do things that they, they are not quite ready to do because they don't have the internal cognitive, emotional, interpersonal, and intrapersonal capacities yet. The thing is, adults can grow and develop these capacities, but they need appropriate support and challenge. And in order to provide that support, it helps to remember that there are three most common ways of knowing. I like to use the image of wearing eyeglasses um, because it's something that people can relate to. So if you think about a way of knowing as a meaning-making system, as a pair of glasses, and these are permanent glasses that we keep on all the time. We wear them when we're awake, we wear them when we're sleeping. And as we increase our cognitive, emotional, interpersonal, the way we relate to other people and the way we relate to ourselves, internal capacities, our glasses 
change shape. People most commonly fall into one of three categories. These are, in increasing order of complexity, instrumental knowers, socializing knowers, and self-authoring knowers. Each group of people operates in a certain set of norms, and understanding this is vital to knowing how they'll fit into a team. I asked Ellie to walk us through each of these ways of knowing and why having norms on those teams matters for each type. And when Ellie talks about norms, she's referring to how team members handle conflict, how they have difficult conversations, how they interact with people who disagree or have different perspectives. And she said that all adults with these different ways of knowing all bring certain strengths and certain areas for growth to their teams and schools. So the first group of people we're going to look at are those whom Ellie calls instrumental knowers. What is of ultimate concern to them is doing things the right way. And in their minds, they actually believe that there is a right and wrong way to do things. Other people are either helpers or obstacles to getting their own concrete needs met. So for instrumental knowers, why do norms, real norms, matter on a team? Norms about, you know, what we're going to do when we disagree, what we're going to do when we're in conflict. How are we going to handle that as a team? Norms, having norms for an instrumental knower, they matter because they are a set of rules that instrumental knowers can bank on, that we have a set of rules that we're all going to follow. And if everyone does, we're going to be able to get our work done. That's why they matter to them. Next up, socializing knowers. For socializing knowers, these are adults who are no longer, they don't orient to the world in a dualistic way where there are right or wrong answers. They have the capacity to take a perspective on on different things. And I'm not saying that rules aren't important for socializing knowers. They are important, but they have a different relationship to rules. And rules are not what is ultimately important to them. What's ultimately important to them is having valued others, supervisors, loved ones, people on their teams, approval. And that is what makes them feel whole. Other people's authority figures, coaches, supervisors, team leaders, judgments of them and their instructional practice become their own. What you think of me, if I'm a socializing knower, becomes and is what I think of me. Having norms when working on a team creates a safe space where socializing knowers feel a little bit more comfortable saying what they really think and feel, which is a growing edge for a socializing knower. Why? Because what's at risk from them for them is if they say something that is in contrast to what a valued other thinks and feels, they worry that the relationship is going to fall apart. That's how hard it is. And yet, if on teams, we want everyone to be able to share their perspective, we have to create the conditions where that can happen. And norms are one way to to create these developmentally robust spaces that are supportive and challenging of adults with different ways of knowing. So what's a growing edge for a socializing knower? The growing edge is really to be able to look on the inside for what he or she or they should do, as opposed to only looking on the outside. And the last most common way of knowing we'll look at are those who are self-authoring. So for people who are self-authoring knowers, they are no longer identified with and run by other people's expectations of them and their relationships. They can actually take a perspective on their relationships. If they need to take a stand for what they believe in and have a difficult conversation, they can actually turn toward conflict. Self-authoring knowers have the internal capacity to actually take in other people's perspectives, bring them inside of themselves to their own bench of judgment, and determine what they're going to do with safe feedback on their instructional practice. They no longer look to supervisors and authority figures and coaches for what they think of them because they, they have their own thinking about what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. But self-authoring knowers, just like people with any way of knowing, also have growing edges. So what is their growing edge? A self-authoring knower's growing edge is to critique one's own ideology. 
to be able to stand in relationship and kind of open themselves up to diametrically opposing perspectives. So why do norms matter for self-authoring knowers? Norms matter for them because it frees them up a little bit usually. They don't have to assume leadership for everything that's going on. It allows them the space to be able to know that they're also going to have a turn to contribute and so will other people. For them, being a team leader is a supportive kind of a role. For them, being a facilitator oftentimes taps into their growing edges because a facilitator's job is to actually bring diverging perspectives together. Ellie was quick to point out that higher or more complex ways of knowing, such as the self-authoring category, aren't necessarily better. And research does not show that those who fall into those categories are happier or more intelligent or more satisfied with life than those who are, say, instrumental knowers. What I do want to say, though, is that leaders must be able to demonstrate those capacities that Stephen Covey dedicated his life to understanding what is it that makes people highly effective in their work. And those capacities like owning one's work, being able to engage in difficult conversations, seeking win-win, those are capacities that I'm going to call our self-authoring capacities. And the big idea here is that when we invite teachers into leadership positions, that is a developmental process. When we invite principals to assume the principalship and superintendents to assume the superintendency, those are positions that require a person, you know, a person needs to be able to demonstrate self-authoring capacities. So that's really important to keep in mind. Thinking about these different ways of knowing, I asked Ellie to talk through some of the implications this all has for teaching and learning, especially in the context of a team of teachers working together in a school. What does it look like when different ways of knowing and different perspectives come together? We often need people on teaching teams to present their best thinking, to share their perspectives with each other. And if, if, if a person is a socializing knower, even if they can look internally for what they think should be going on, they defer to people who are authority figures. They will scan the team to figure out how they can say something that won't offend anyone. Whereas self-authoring knowers, you know, they can still have a value for relationships when working together on a team, when collaborating. I mean, teaming and collaboration are part of the new normal. It's part of the air we breathe every day. We're collaborating with other adults. And if people can't engage in difficult conversations and turn toward conflict and discuss things that are hard on behalf of students, on behalf of best practice, if they believe there's only one right way and that conflict should never come up, you know, instrumental knowers think that conflict should not come up because if everyone would just follow the rules and the policies and the procedures, we'd have no conflict. Socializing knowers don't want conflict to come up. And I've had people say this to me. A lot of socializing knowers will say, you know, if we really tell each other on a team what we think about each other's instructional practice, we're not going to be a team anymore. People aren't going to want to collaborate. All of our relationships will fall apart. That's detrimental to improving teaching and learning in school context. Ellie said that the need to develop leaders, to support and empower teachers to become more self-authoring, is essential. You can't put someone into a leadership role and expect that they can just do it. Becoming a leader is a developmental process. And that is why, one of the many reasons why the work that Christy is doing for those teachers, I have goosebumps all over in her district, and this is, this is not the first time she's done it. She's not just giving them content. She's giving them spaces where they can address the things that are really hard for them, that, that they need to do as leaders creating those spaces where they're learning about themselves and how to be better leaders and how to grow that capacity on the inside so that they can do the things that good team leaders do. 
that they can take stands for what they believe in, that they can engage in difficult conversations, not just with their colleagues, but also with their supervisors. If you're thinking, this is pretty complicated stuff, I don't even know how to start this kind of leadership development, you're not alone. And that's why Christy and Ellie created a professional development series to teach teachers how to be more self-aware, how to have critical conversations, how to identify what their own way of knowing is, as well as that of others. They select a cohort of teachers and meet monthly over a four-year time frame to explore a set of pillar practices that Ellie developed around concepts like teaming and feedback. And so during the, these sessions, not only did teachers learn about different parts of the p- pillar practices from Ellie, such as teaming and engaging in, in collegial inquiry, but they experience it the entire time. A lot of people don't even know what a good team is. And, and we try to model that and practice a lot of the things that Ellie says will, will support teachers and teams. So we have norms, we have check-ins, we practice having critical conversations, we talk about things that are that are challenging for us. And that way our teachers are supported. And, and the goal is that when they go back into their teams, not only are they stronger um, and, and their capacity is growing, but they also can can share that influence and spread it so that not only is our cohort of teachers getting better, but our, our schools are becoming stronger as well. I asked Ellie to give me some real life examples. How do these ideas play out in the real world? How does she see these different ways of knowing affect teams of teachers that she works with? So I think one very powerful example, you know, teaming is really, really hard. It can be hard for instrumental knowers because, you know, at first they're going to need different kinds of support when they first are exposed to that there really isn't necessarily one right way to do things, you know? In fact, we're going we're gonna to try to get as many perspectives out on the table as possible. I often get called in to work with teams. Just last week, I was at a district working with a team that's a senior level team, superintendent, the deputy superintendent, the principals and the vice principals. I mean, I get called in to work a lot with teams. And usually the reason what will happen is people will call me and can you teach us about, you know, a developmental approach to feedback? That'll be the first conversation. That's why we want you to come in and work with us. This is a true story over the course of a year because, like, we can't give feedback to each other. I say, okay, great. You know, have you developed norms? Oh, yeah, we have norms, but they're fake norms. They don't really mean anything. Okay. And then we'll have a a phone call where I'll be, you know, I'm thinking of this one team. It's a team of 26. It's composed of deans, principals, assistant principals, district office people, and the superintendent. We'll have a phone call with, with a few key people, including the superintendent. You know, after talking for about an hour or an hour and a half on that day, the superintendent told everyone that they could get off the phone. And she said, you know, Ellie, Really, really the problem here is that we have a little trust problem. And I said, oh, because there is no such thing as a little trust problem. And when you don't have trust on a team, you know, people say to me a lot in institutes that I facilitate and co-facilitate with Christy, can't we just do it over again? Start from scratch. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that, no, you can't. You cannot do that. And that's one of the reasons that understanding ways of knowing is so important and also developing norms. So how does this play out? In this case, working with a team under the auspices of a developmental approach to feedback, really setting the norms. This is, you know, you might be like, what? But setting the norms, there was so much in that room on that team that people with different ways of knowing could not speak out. There was too much at risk for them.
So understanding that you need to design even professional learning institutes like this, keeping in mind that you have to use a variety of different practices, invite people to write, invite people to pair up, invite them to have a choice to talk with their own small group, then bring it all to the center, develop norms in that way. That process took us four hours, but it completely shifted the way members of that team over time related to each other. It also shifted the ways that they communicated, not just with the other principals at the same level, but also with the superintendent. And I've been working with this team now for three years, and they are completely different. And I always have to remind them, do you remember what you were like three years ago? And now people use this language, like, okay, here my socializingness is coming out. Here's what I'm afraid of. This is a true story. I'm afraid that if I actually give you feedback to the supervisor, that you're not going to ever forget it, and you're going to hold it against me in my evaluations, if I ever want to go for a new job. You know, this is a real true story. The woman, like, just started crying in front of everyone. And those moments really can bring people together to do better work together. I mean, the superintendent was constantly telling me early on, I can't get any of my work done because I've got a team that's so emotional. You know what I mean? That was her code word for, you know, I have many socializing knowers and I need them to tell me what they're really thinking and feeling. But they feel so at risk because they think that they're going to lose their relationships with each other and with me. I also asked Christy to talk about her own experience working with teams and how she has seen teamwork and collaboration change at schools where she has worked over the past five to ten years. So in the classroom, the school that I was a teacher in, to revisit my previous example, where I was a teacher and I had desperately thought that we should offer a workshop to parents. And my very well-intentioned, smart, hardworking colleagues were like, please don't do that. That makes us look bad. That's an example of of what is, you know, well-researched egalitarian norms, which which are present in school. And and you know, it's it's equal is what is good. And we all have to be the same. And and to Ellie's point, you can see where that could be very comfortable for a lot of people with certain ways of knowing. Christy said that in that school, as she and Ellie conducted their professional learning program around teaming, they saw change start to happen organically. As teachers saw they had the support of their team, they began to do things like start programs, host lunch and learns, and get excited about what was happening across their entire team. And when people started to do that with that support, other teachers started coming too. And so all of a sudden there were, there were at least monthly lunch and learns. There was in that same school, there was a teacher who said, I really want to do an outreach program for, for a lot of our ESL students. And she hosted that. There was another teacher who said, I want to do a fitness program for our kids. And you saw these teacher led, not prompted, not reimbursed, you know, for their time, they let their, their greatness shine through. And it completely changed the culture from a few years before when I said, maybe could I please do this workshop for parents just to help us to there's something happening almost every month. And it's led by teachers. It's no secret that teachers have a lot on their plates. It's a hard job. And that's a big barrier to teacher leadership, Christy says. But collaboration is absolutely critical to teaching in today's world with today's standards. You just can't do it alone. You know, if we look at the standards, like next generation science standards, at the bottom of those science standards, it's all literacy based. That means that your ELA teacher and your science teachers, they need to be able to work together. And so if you can give the teachers in our care the tools to collaborate with things like norms, to engage in critical conversations, then their team meetings can become places where they get things done, where they work together and they want to partner on things. So I think that giving them the space 
and, and the professional development where it's okay for them to, to stand out a little bit, to break through those egalitarian norms, but then also helping them to bring those tools back to their team meetings. So team meetings become a place of productivity where they're collaborating and sharing the workload instead of everybody doing it on their own in silos. And then I think that the next piece of that is also making sure that this type of professional learning is done in, in a cohort and in a team so that they have other people that they can rely on too, who who can support and share the burden of this work as well. And it, it's really helpful when more than one person has gone through this training and, and they can say, let's do have these norms and let's create this agenda and let's get through this. And so I think that while our teachers do have an overwhelming amount of work to do, the answer is to show them and, and, and help them develop the capacities and tools to be more collaborative and more productive. And then I think our teachers can even do more than what we're asking them for. I have one more question for each of you. I'll start with you, Christy. And that is, looking back over the past five to 10 years, what have you personally learned? What has been the most important or interesting or impactful learning that you have taken that other leaders in school systems across the country might gain value from? I think my biggest learning is being an educator is hard. It's hard if you're a teacher. It's hard if you're an administrator. And it's also very complicated. We need this type of professional learning, the adult development, more than ever before because we also need to be able to collaborate and to work together. We need our teams to be places where we can bring what we're struggling with and it can be a safe place where we can collaborate on a solution. Our education system desperately needs more of an understanding of adult development. And if you can bring this work in, thinking about how to support people where they are is what is going to give you the most gains in retention for teachers and gains in student performance. And that's because I think to Ellie's point, which her story that um, started her research is that if you have a happier work environment, people are able to learn more, to do more, and kids will learn and do more too. And Ellie, I'd like to ask you, you have talked about a lot of really incredible stuff today. If there is one takeaway from today, if if someone forgets everything else and remembers one thing from your work or that you and Christy have talked about today in this interview, what would you say is the the one thing that most people need the most? <laughs> that is a very hard question, Ryan. <laughs> I'm going to sneak in about two little subheaders to this big header, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. So the one big thing I think that is a, an important takeaway is that a one-size-fits-all approach to supporting other adults is not going to do it for really building the kind of schools and districts that we want for our children. If we can learn to differentiate the ways that we offer both supports and challenges and remember those glasses that people wear, I think that, and this is proven, I mean, districts that, and schools that adopt this, you know, developmental learning stance and this common language and these pillar practices, their achievement scores over time do skyrocket. So, you know, people always want to know what's the bottom line. And the bottom line is that we need to do something different because we need to help our students. And one of the most fruitful paths to doing that is to focus on taking good care of the adults so that they can bring their best selves to their teaching and their leadership every day that they enter the schoolhouse. And if you were to ask me, well, what's the most important first step, which you didn't ask, but this is what I'm sneaking in, it's very important to start with the small things. So if we really want to build cultures of collaboration and places where people can speak authentically 
and see vulnerability as strength and bring all that they know to the table, we need to create spaces where the audios match the visuals, where people know that they are trusted, there's a sense of safety, and they are respected for the work they do every day. And that is a precondition to doing any of this kind of work around collaboration and teaming and building more effective school places. Dr. Ellie Drago Severson is a professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and Christy O'Connor is an administrator at Florham Park School District in New Jersey. New episodes of Field Trip are released every two weeks. Don't miss a single one. Subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Field Trip is a podcast from Frontline Education. Frontline's industry-leading software is designed exclusively for K-12 and is built to help school systems recruit, hire, engage, develop, and retain their employees. For more information, visit frontlineeducation.com slash field trip podcast. For Frontline Education, I'm Ryan Estes. Thanks for listening and have a great day.